Good morning, Sonoma Valley Community Church family and friends. So glad to be here at 181 Chase Street in Sonoma, California. And so glad to have Don and Georgia back who are celebrating 61 years of marital bliss. Amen? <laughs> So we're here this morning to worship our Lord and Savior and to learn more together about his love and wisdom and uh, insight for us. And one of the verses that I just love to pieces, I just love it, love it, love it, is this verse, Isaiah 48, 17, which says in the New American Standard Bible, Thus says the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you in the way that you should go. Amen? <laughs> Amen. We can have confidence this morning that God is in the business of teaching us how to live life the best that we can possibly live it. Yes, there are issues that come up. Yes, there is adversity. Yes, there can be all sorts of reasons to despair or to struggle but nonetheless the Lord our God teaches us to profit even from adversity and to come back swinging and to come back keeping on keeping on and this morning we want to invite his presence to help us believe receive and follow in his footsteps let's take a moment to pray Lord God we thank you so much for your goodness and grace in the land of the living, and that you're a God who doesn't let us falter when adversity comes our way. Lord God, we pray that you would speak to us this morning in the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would inhabit the praises of your people, that you would strengthen those who are not able to be here this morning uh, because they are in places where they are recovering from surgery, or from accidents, or from illness. Lord God, we pray also for your ministry of this church out into the community of Sonoma. Lord, we love Sonoma, and we pray that you would help us to demonstrate that as we invite people to church on Easter Sunday and in the Sundays before then. Lord God, help us to be a church that welcomes everybody in. And that keeps hugging, keeps loving, keeps caring um, as the days go by. We pray, Lord God, for you to bless this service with your presence. I pray, Lord God, that you might interrupt this service at any time with your presence, with a sense of, of, of you instructing us. And we pray, Lord God, that you would be glorified and pleased by the songs that we sing and by the worship we offer you now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's so good to see you this morning. And as we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship, I want to let you know that next week is spring forward week. <laughs> it's the Sunday when we got to come an hour earlier, right? Spring forward. Daylight savings time is happening. And so this morning, you don't have any excuses for not standing up and singing and, and enjoying and serving the Lord as we praise his great name. Because next week we're going to come in a little tired and a little uh, like we're missing an hour of sleep. But not this Sunday, not today. Today is the day that the Lord has made. And I want to invite my wife to come forward. Charlotte, uh, it's always good and wonderful to sing with you the praises of our Lord. Amen. And uh, so I want to invite you, if you're able, to stand and to join us in singing praises to our Lord. When I look into your holiness, when I gaze into your love, that surround become shadows in the light of you when I found the joy of reaching 
searching your heart when my will becomes enthroned in your love when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you I worship you Consecrate. 
feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee, ever only all for thee. So Thanks be to God for these precious songs. We want to declare our faith. There's 1.3 billion Christians around the world who are worshiping our Lord and Savior at some time in these 24 hours uh, this weekend. And I want to invite us to just re remember and to redeclare our faithfulness to Him by reading the words that come from Scripture that invite us to be faithful to all that He has for us. I believe in God the Father, Jesus the Son of God and man, and the Holy Spirit, according to the Bible, God's only and written final word. I agree with God to love Him with all my heart, all my mind, all my soul, and all my strength, and love my neighbor as myself. 
I invite God's forgiveness and favor daily to establish my life and good works as a witness to his tender mercy and great glory. And I choose to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit by faith, seek God's wisdom in the scriptures, please God and believe all truth is God's truth, pray God's promises and expect miracles, and persevere to become all I was created to be as a child of the Most High God. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise God. There's a lot that, hold, that we hold in common as Christians. And one of those things, if I go back to that second declaration, is I agree with God to love Him with all my heart, all my mind, all my soul, and all my strength, and love my neighbor as myself. Jesus said that those are the very words that describe upon which all the prophets, all the law, all the scripture hangs. If you want to distill it all down, it's about loving God with all that we are and loving our neighbor as ourself. I'm so glad that we are here in the house of God to remind ourselves and each other that that's the essence of our relationship with God. So with that said, I want to invite us to open our hearts and to prepare ourselves for communion. We do this once a month as a church. Sometimes we do it at other times. And uh, communion is a very special time because Jesus reminded us that we're supposed to do this in remembrance of him. And so if you've come into the sanctuary today and haven't grabbed one of the communion cups with a little piece of bread on the top, Arlene is passing it out right there and you'll get a you'll get a cup and you'll be able to have that for yourself and we'll be able to share in communion. Communion is a special time for me because I became a Christian in the context of a communion service. There was a pastor at a youth camp that was telling us that uh, we should take it seriously. And if you're really serious about it, then you're going to want to give your heart, your life, your, your future into God's hands. And so I raised my hand and prayed that day, and I felt the grace of God come into my life. And I'm just so grateful for what God has done in my life. I'm not perfect. I got problems. And I don't always do everything that I should, but... It's amazing how God has continued to bless me and to walk with me and to help me uh, to receive forgiveness and to move in the right direction, loving people and loving God. And that's what we're doing right now. We're remembering how Christ died on the cross and rose to newness of life and that the promise of our own eternal salvation lies in what he did 2,000 some years ago. So with that said, I'd like to start by singing a little song just to get us in our hearts and our minds to relax, to take, take some time to let the things of this world drift off our shoulders and to commune with him. Olga? To commune with you what my heart desires to commune with you is when my spirit breathes when I'm in the presence of your Amen. 
Scripture says this in the first Corinthians chapter 11 verse 23 for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way he took the cup also after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I lift up this bread as a symbol of the body of Christ that was broken for us in faith we receive the bread of Christ. Let's partake together. And this wine is a symbol of the blood of Christ, the precious blood of Christ that was spilt on the ground 2,000 years ago pouring out to forgive us to cleanse us to renew us and to embrace us this is the blood of Christ by faith let's partake together Lord God, our minds are probably not great enough to fully understand the extent by which you need to forgive us. Lord God, we humble ourselves because we're not always see seeking after you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And at times, we don't act like we should towards our neighbor. Lord God, we invite your forgiveness, your cleansing, your renewal, your tender mercy. Lord, forgive me where I fail to be the husband, the father, the, the man, the businessman, the pastor that you've called me to be. Lord God, thank you for this church and for its history of 77 years. Lord God, maybe as a church, we haven't always been all that we could be. But this morning, Lord, we declare that everybody is welcome. We declare that we're supposed to love people deeply from the heart and forgive them. Lord, we declare that this church is not ours but yours we declare Lord God that there are people who are hurting the poor the marginalized 
the broken. Lord God, the disabled. Lord, help us to be a place where everybody can find their voice before a living God. We pray, Lord God, that you would do a miraculous work within our hearts to strengthen us for the coming month. Lord, as we think about Easter, Lord, help us to make teachable moments happen with people who we love or just getting to know so we can invite them into your presence. Lord, thank you for what you've done in our lives. Lord, help us to be embracing of those who don't know you yet. And Lord, if, if needs be, help us wash feet. Help us provide food, clothing, shelter, the shirt off our back, to do whatever it takes to help people meet Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Lord, we pray that this might be a very special day of renewing our hearts and our minds by the Holy Spirit. We pray for your restoration, for your love, for your grace. Lord, help us to embrace everybody who we meet in this coming month with the love of Christ. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand for a moment. In moments like these, I sing out a song. I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like these, I lift up my hands. I lift up my hands to the Lord, singing, I love you, Lord, singing, I love you, Lord, singing, I love you, Lord, I love you, singing, wonderful to partake in communion. I hope you're sensing the Holy Spirit in the house, that God loves you, that God is for you, not against you, and that God has the best moments of life with Him still ahead of you. The promise of His Spirit today is that God is busy working in our lives to still help us move forward and advance with the kingdom of God. Our passage this morning comes from Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. So if you have a Bible in your pew rack in front of you or you brought your own, you're more than welcome to uh, read along. There, yep, you got one. Anyways, um, so our, my passage this morning is focused on Jesus embracing a man with a perceived disability, the disability of shortness. And so his name is Zacchaeus, and we're going to hear more about his life. Chapter 19, verse 1. He entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man 
called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. When they saw it, they all began to grumble, 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 saying, He is gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me just camp on that last verse. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Every once in a while in Scripture, you get right into the heart of, of the matter and of the motivation that Jesus has in working with people in the context of the ministry and the kingdom of God that is taking place in their lives. Maybe you in Sunday school when you were young heard the story of Zacchaeus, the little man who climbed up a sycamore tree and sat in that tree I mean, I can remember, uh, not that I was a Christian when I was um, a young kid, but when um, I later, when I was in my high school and then college years and had become a Christian, I remember this story because I real, uh, it re always reminded me that I don't usually worry at all about being too short. And uh, I don't know about you, but shortness is not something that I usually think about. But it's interesting to meet people who are short because they have acute awareness of their surroundings. And they're usually the people who get more done than anybody else. They usually succeed at life because they put in extra effort. They usually overcome this social sense of deprivation by overcompensating for it and, and being, being larger than life in who they are. It's sort of like God gives them an extra motivation to do well and to succeed and to be a blessing. The person and personality of Christ can carry a surplus of meaning that can challenge and transform us and the way that the world works. Jesus can make a difference. And the promise of conversion to Jesus Christ is the promise of a more preferable future. There's not a person here this morning who doesn't want a more preferable future for themselves. Those who follow Christ discover that he is the Lord who is compassionate, yet de a determined disruptor of worldly allegiances and structures and the status quo when he gathers followers together who rapidly change their values from the city of man to a heavenly one. Christ's followers change the public conversation when they allow God to influence them. They start making new choices about how they will manage their material possessions and carry themselves in community or stand apart. That is the one, one of the main lessons of this conversion story of Zacchaeus, the wealthy chief tax gatherer and Jewish leader who lived during the times of Jesus of Nazareth. Everything changes for him. 
and the social fabric of his life when Jesus comes to his home and into his heart. Perhaps the most important verse of our passage, as far as Zacchaeus is concerned, is when Jesus comes to the very spot under the sycamore tree and looks up at Zacchaeus, who is much higher than Jesus at that moment, and says, Today I must stay at your house. It's a command. It is a It is a determined reverse invitation. Jesus is showing up and saying, I want to come to your house. What happens when people experience Jesus coming to their house? Well, 1 Peter tells us that this great mercy, through his great mercy, he has given us new birth into living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1 3. Why does that verse come to mind? Because Jesus is the living hope that walks into our homes and changes how we operate. He changes what we value. He changes how we operate because He raises our sights to be better than we would ever otherwise be if we allow His Holy Spirit into our home. If we allow His Holy Spirit into our hearts. You see, There is a real sense in which my heart, my mind is Christ's home when I am a Christian. My heart and my mind are Christ's home when I'm a Christian. And when that is truly the case, not pretend, not superficial, not religiosity, but actually a true reality that Jesus comes into your heart and mind and takes takes residence, then all of a sudden, it starts to be seen in our behavior. It starts to be seen in how we treat one another as we look at ourselves and as we envision the future. Jesus brings what the world considers upside-down values, but nonetheless, they are part of our journey, our pilgrimage into salvation. We don't know how old Zacchaeus was when Jesus walked over to the sycamore tree that he was hiding in. But we do know that he was a man of privilege, a man who was a servant of the Roman government, and a man scorned by his own people. Nobody liked him. Now I want to ask you, honestly, we're just a few weeks away from April 15th, tax day. How many people have taken time recently to go and hug your tax accountant? I don't see any hands raised here. You know why? Because by nature, we feel that there's something wrong about the government taking money from our lives. And we get upset about it. In fact, a lot of the polarization taking place in America today is rooted in an infantile argument about how many taxes we should pay and how big the government should be. And we're willing to almost kill each other over the tax question of how much money is owed back to the United States government, which is we the people. And so this tax issue has been driving a whole lot of foolishness and conflict for a long time. Our country was birthed in a tax revolution when the Americans didn't want to pay taxes to Britain anymore. Now, I'm an immigrant. I wasn't born in America. So I don't have a history here that goes back generations. I'm a first-generation immigrant. But I got to tell you, this is not an exciting thing to see our country seemingly being torn apart over a tax issue. And so as I look back to the man Zacchaeus, I get a little bit of empathy for him. Nobody liked him. Nobody liked this man, and he was doing business in a corrupt way. He was a corrupt man because he would not only take taxes from people, but then he would take extra taxes from them and line his own pockets because the Bible says he was rich. 
Let's get even more specific. There are two reasons why this man would never go to heaven. Ever. One reason was that he was corrupt with regards to the business he did. If you don't think that the business you do matters, you're sadly mistaken. If you live in a corrupt business structure and you're not trying to live in an honorable way with regards to what you're doing in your business, if you're taking advantage of people for personal gain, that is a disqualification for going to heaven. The second disqualification that Zacchaeus had for going to heaven was that he was wealthy. You see, Jesus said that those who are rich cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples said, if we have given up everything and the rich can't even make it to heaven, how can we who've given everything up and come to follow you? And Jesus said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And so Jesus is bringing salvation to the home of a man that everybody counted out. And on the surface, even heaven was against Zacchaeus. And yet what we are seeing here is a testimony and a, a story of a man who humbles himself. Because he thought so much of himself and he was up in the tree and he comes down and he meets with Jesus and he's glad to welcome Jesus into his heart, into his mind, into his home. And when he invites Jesus to come into his home, we don't know all the things that happened in terms of the rationale that moved Zacchaeus from being a pre-Christian to being an actual Christian. And more, more than that, he was a Jew. Why would he all of a sudden shift religions and shift his focus? Well, Jesus had a lot to do with that shift. He became the living hope. Now, there's a lot of people in our world who are lost. They may not know they are lost. They may not feel they are lost until they actually do feel a spiritual lostness in their lives. And that spiritual lostness can, can manifest in a lot of different ways. Struggles with alcohol, struggles with relationships, struggles with uh, family members, a sense that you're not accomplishing anything with your life, a hunger for meaning that just overwhelms. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And Jesus also tells us here in verse 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. That is good news, my friends, because Jesus is taking the initiative to reach the lost. There is not a sense of just waiting for the attraction principle to happen. No, he's out there looking for people, and he found Zacchaeus, and he found you, my dear, the one who comes here with a whole bowl full of dolmas. Praise God. And, uh, you know, it's just exciting. When people know Christ, it changes a lot in their lives. Amen? And so Zacchaeus is a very important person in the Scriptures because he's only one of two or so, a very small club of people who we know are saved because Jesus said they were saved. You see, the only other person was the guy hanging on the cross. He said, today you will be in paradise with me. And he also said to this man, Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to you. My friends, conversion stories happen when you're around Jesus. People transform. I did it at a camp in the Sierra Nevada. I was maybe six, 17 years old, and it made such a difference, such a difference. 
I grew up in a wealthy family that didn't have the values of Christ. And now that I'm 60, I'm still struggling with how to manage those relationships. But I realize that I have a lot to be thankful for because I was lost. I came from Europe to America and I had to learn a new language. I had to learn a new culture. I had to learn a new way of being. I had to leave my family. I had to leave my grandfather. I had to leave my father. I had to leave my relatives. I had to leave my, my language. I had to leave the history. I had to leave everything to come here. And at age 13, I became an American citizen. And I want to tell you that we do the same when we become Christians. We move from one place to becoming citizens of heaven. Citizens with an a allegiance to Jesus. Not to the Republican Party. Not to the Democratic Party. But to Jesus and to the kingdom of God. That's all that matters. That's all that really matters. When you are having your funeral service, it will not be that people say, my, you were such a great Democrat. My, you were such a great Republican. No, they will say he was a great Christian. He made a difference in my life or he made a difference in my company or he made a difference in, my, in the family that I, I am with. Zacchaeus is a very important character in the Bible because he is a concrete example of a sinful man who meets with Jesus. And that encounter all by itself not that they sat down and read the ta Torah together. Not that they decided to uh, like have big spiritual or theological discussions. No, Zacchaeus met Jesus. And when he met Jesus, Jesus got to look into the rooms of his life. He saw the room where he eats. He saw the room where he sleeps. He saw the storage room. He saw the workroom. He saw the bathroom. He saw everything in that man's life. And he still loved and embraced Zacchaeus. He was a rich man. He had a lot to show. But when we see his heart change, when he says, I'm going to give half of everything I own to the poor, and I'm going to give four times to anybody that I've ripped off, you can see that that's not a decision made lightly. That's a decision that changed his life. Now, there are different perspectives on, G on Zacchaeus, and one is from the perspective of the crowd. And you can see in this picture, the little guy in the, in the white uh, shawl, he's about a head or more shorter than the crowd. And the crowd has a view of him. They think he's awful. They think he's no good. He's a waste of time. And more than that, Jesus associating with Jesus is blasphemy in their view. They think that Jesus is making a big mistake to find out who this little guy is and then go to his home. Why? Not because of his height, but because he's a tax collector for the Romans. And because he's a tax collector with the Romans... The crowd thinks that he is an apostate. He's not worthy to even be part of the Jewish nation in their perspective. And the crowd gives no forgiveness, gives no pathway to redemption for Zacchaeus. But just as the crowd saw Zacchaeus' sin, we also tend to see others' mistakes and sins, especially when they are more obvious. We are quick to judge others, but forget to look at our own lives if we are too sinful. That's why Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, why are you so focused on the speck in your brother's eye when you have a log hanging out of yours? It was a spiritual kind of attempt at humor. It was, a, it was a memorable saying because we, like the, when we are like the crowd, miss out on what God's really wanting to do in that man's life. 
Now there is another perspective, and that is the perspective of Zacchaeus of himself. Zacchaeus knew about Jesus the whole time that he was up in that tree. And he was excited to finally see him because he was very short. He tried to find other ways in order to finally see Jesus. I don't know what kept him from seeing Jesus earlier in Jesus' life and mission. He did this, though, on a certain day at a certain time by climbing a sycamore tree. Based on the story, we can easily see Zacchaeus' character. He was a go-getter and possibly one of the characteristics and attributes a tax collector should have because their job entails asking and sometimes taking money from others. Now, my tax accountant doesn't ask and doesn't take. She just gives a deadline. I want all your tax documents by March 1, and I want them in the smart vault so that I can see them electronically. And if you don't have them all lined up, then guess what? You're going to have to pay more starting the next day or don't do my services at all. So my tax accountant doesn't come knocking on my door asking for money. But in this time, the way the taxes work, those tax collectors would go out among the people and make efforts to bring in the money that they needed to bring in, that they were required to bring in, and then even more for themselves. Being a tax collector was not an easy job for him because of the nature of his business and how the crowd perceived him. He, however, was very happy to see Jesus. Jesus seemed to be the lifeline for his little life. A life that didn't have meaning. A life that was in, in contrast to everyone else around him. You know, it is important that we show repentance for the sins that we commit. After all, it's written in Luke 3, even tax collectors came to be baptized in front of John the Baptist. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? And John the Baptist responded, don't collect any more than you are required to. So tax collectors come up time and again in the New Testament. They come up for John the Baptist. Matthew was a tax collector until he became a follower. We wouldn't have the Gospel of Matthew if it wasn't for God's graciousness through Jesus. Jesus embraced the other. He embraced those who were marginalized, who were rejected, who did not have a place in the nation. And so Zacchaeus is excited. Would Jesus embrace him? And then we have the perspective of Zacchaeus from the point of view of Jesus. Jesus decided to come to the house of Zacchaeus even though he was a sinner. He was a big sinner, but there was a bigger God. A bigger God than his sin. My friends, this morning the good news is that God is bigger than our sin. There is nobody, I don't care who it is and what they're doing, who cannot come into the presence of Jesus and be changed if they want to. If they want to change their lives. What are our takeaways this morning? Well, the first takeaway, I think, is that we are Zacchaeus in a very real way. We are Zacchaeus. We are Zacchaeus, and yet we are also the crowd. Zacchaeus was portrayed in the Bible as a sinful tax collector and despised by the crowd. He was also portrayed as someone who, despite his inability to see Jesus, found his way by climbing a sycamore tree. He did what he could to get close to Jesus. And finally, he was the person that Jesus saw and demanded to stay at his home. Now there's a second takeaway also, and that is long before Zacchaeus couldn't see Jesus, the tree was planted to meet his need. Think about that. Long before Zacchaeus couldn't see Jesus, the tree was planted to meet his need. I love that idea. Because you see, God has resources 
ahead of us, ahead of our awareness right now, that He has put together so that we will take a journey one step further towards getting close to God. And I believe that all the traumas that are happening in our world today also have resources hidden around the world that can help us if we are willing to seek Christ for His wisdom. The tree was a natural resource on property that someone might have owned at that time. Jesus helped Zacchaeus see Him because He planned years ahead for that tree to be available for Him. Has God got a tree available for us to see Him better? I love that that lesson there, that God has planned for us, for our need, long before we may even feel it. And then finally, meaning is found in relationship with Jesus. The story of the chief tax collector Zacchaeus and his encounter with Jesus reminds us that even the rich and powerful need Christ and that God is able to bring meaning into their lives when they have no meaning at all. I've seen my family disintegrate over millions of dollars. There is no meaning in having millions of dollars. I've seen people's lives empty because they have way too much money. On the other hand, we have to live with money. We need a basis for commerce. We need to be able to transact. We need to be able to do business in this world. And so God gives us the strength, some more than others, to manage their lives and to manage resources to advance the kingdom of God. And this morning, I recognize with all of us that our God and Creator has an answer for us. I love what Pope John Paul II said, and with this I close, Deepen your knowledge of Jesus, which ends loneliness, overcomes sadness and uncertainty, gives real meaning to life, curbs passions, exalts ideals, expands energies in charity, brings light to decisive choice into decisive choices let christ be for you the way the truth and the life isn't that an incredible quote he's saying there that if you embrace jesus and jesus really embraces you you will find the answers that your soul is longing for let's pray lord god we thank you for the promise that comes with conversion to Christ. Lord God, destinies of nations happen when people come to Christ. There's a lot of people in America that need to come to Christ. A lot of people who think they are Christians, but they're not, who need to come to Christ. A lot of people who don't know Jesus, have not read the Bible, have not met Zacchaeus, have not learned how great the love of God is for them. I pray, Lord God, for a Jesus revolution here in Sonoma and here in California, just like it took place 50 years ago. Oh, Lord God, have your way with us. Bring a heart for conversion and for baptism and for people doing the things of God. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Well, let's give a hand to the Lord, huh? Amen. To the Lord. To the Lord Jesus Christ. His body is working here. And God's been doing a lot of good things in our, in our life. I want to let you know that I'm going to be gone this Friday and Saturday in Fresno. Now, I wouldn't normally go to Fresno. But I'm going there for some meetings from the classes that's taking place. And I'll be representing our church with regards to that. If there's anybody who wants to go with me, you're welcome. And we can talk about those details. And we'll see what's going on with our denomination. It's not my denomination. 
but it's this church's denomination. And so I need to find out what's going on and report back. And there will be a consistory meeting, a leadership meeting on Tuesday the 14th for those who are, uh, who are wanting to be a part of that and for all our leadership. Also want to let you know that, again, it is spring forward this coming week. We're going to lose an hour, so plan for it now. Go to bed a little earlier next Saturday night, okay? And then I want to give you our Easter schedule. Good Friday service will be the 7th of 23, and I ran into Pastor Steve Rays of the Lighthouse Church, and we're looking to maybe combine churches for that Good Friday service right here at our sanctuary. So the place will be packed with people wanting to celebrate Good Friday. And then Easter Sunday. Two things I want to see by God's grace and favor. One is to invite people to a pancake breakfast. Just give it away. I don't care if we get money back for it and I'll pay for all the pancakes and syrup and everything. Uh, but we, we want to give people something to eat and to enjoy. And then we'll have our Easter Sunday service at 1030. Now I want to let you know that's going to be going out through tens of thousands of of digital advertising uh, visuals from our newspaper, the Sonoma Index Tribune. So we are busy reaching out to the people of our Sonoma and our region through their digital advertising support. So I want to let you know that we got a lot happening in preparation for a great Easter time. So with that said, I'd like to also say that if, if you come today with your offerings, your tithes, you can put them in the box in the back, or you can send a check to uh, 181 Chase Street, Sonoma, California, or you can go on our website, welovesonoma.com, and you can find out um, how to give through the giving page that's there. And that phone number gets right to my cell phone, and I'll be happy to talk with you, happy to pray with you, happy to have an appointment with you. This coming week, I'll be here on Wednesday, and I look forward to seeing you if you want to meet for lunch or in the afternoon sometime for an appointment. With that said, let's stand up and let's close with the doxology and a, a sense that God is working in our lives. Olga. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. May the favor and the love and the grace of God be yours. May you walk in joy in this coming week with all the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's take time to fellowship together. And if any of you want prayer, you're welcome to come forward. I'd be happy to pray with you.